All right, guys, it's a uh, beautiful Las Vegas morning. It's nice and cool just before the heat comes. And let's do a little update on the camper van project. So first and foremost, I wanna, I wanna thank everybody for all of the uh, detailed and lengthy and thoughtful comments regarding all the various questions I asked and all the various ideas. You guys gave me a lot to think about and I'm still mulling over a lot of things. Uh, a lot of great insights and uh, really appreciate that and uh, feel free you guys to keep them coming. Um, you guys really did honestly change my headspace in terms of uh, some of the places I think I was, I'm going. Uh, in this video, uh, in the previous video I talked about, I had a, a few mechanical issues I had to address. In this video, I want to talk about those. Um, I haven't made up any firm decisions. Uh, I did test a few of the appliances in here, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but I have not made any firm decisions in terms of where the overall plan will be. But let's, uh, let's touch on some of the mechanical things. So first and foremost is I had a leaky... Um, uh, filler nozzle, I guess you would say. Basically, the uh, the tubing that goes from uh, where you uh, insert the gas pump uh, and leads to the fuel tank. Um, I dropped the... So the way that this particular vehicle is set up is the black tank actually sits uh, uh, underneath the vehicle immediately adjacent to the wall, and then the fuel tank sits just next to that. So... Um, the tube that goes from the filler hole there uh, to the fuel tank crosses over the top of the black tank, if that makes any sense. Um, so I dropped the black tank. That wasn't that big of a deal, and it's uh, it's empty. Uh, the individual I bought it from described not really ever using it, and I feel pretty... Well, I mean, it had been used at least historically, but there was not a hint of... Uh, it looks like it hadn't been used for, well, maybe perhaps a decade <laughs> Um, so that was at least a pleasant, uh, it wasn't uh, as unpleasant as that sounds. But uh, long story short, on that rubber tube, it's just a corrugated rubber tube, um, I found that there was a crack. And uh, sadly enough, somebody at some point tried to patch it by actually using what looked like packing tape. So I pulled that tube off and I went down to the auto parts store, uh, Napa, and... Um, uh, the, the exact piece that you could buy was about 90, almost a hundred dollars. And I was a little concerned that maybe because this was converted to a class B that the, um, the actual tube piece was a different length than what, uh, just a standard E251 was. And of course there's no way for me to specifically find one. I mean, this is pretty obscure model being a class B here. So what I did do is, uh, thankfully to the uh, staff down there, um, they uh, we went in the back and we found some other rubber filler necks for some other uh, related, uh, or not related vehicles, but some other vehicles. And we found one that was uh, nearly perfect. Just took a little bit of modification. It was only $40 and they had it on hand. So I saved myself some money and uh, got that uh, tied in. And now there is no leak back there. So. The next problem I really wanted to address was a check engine light that was on. And I had mentioned before that uh, that this particular, I believe they call it the EC4 system, but don't quote me on that. Uh, there is a way that you can jump it. And so over here, uh, right here on the inside is, is kind of this, uh, I don't know, I guess you'd call it like a diagnostic wiring. And uh, where did I put it here? Now, this is not necessarily a tutorial on how to do this. Uh, there's other videos where people go into great detail. But what you do is, uh, I'm sure there are other specific tools, but the scan tool I had wasn't showing any codes. I know one of you guys in comments mentioned there was a little bit more of an elaborate tool, but I don't have that. And in lieu of taking it to a shop, I just... Uh, went on YouTube and found out that there is a way that you can jump from this uh, gray plastic piece to, I believe it's this upper one right here. But again, don't quote me on this. This is not a specific tutorial on that. But what you do is you jump this and then you go in the car. There's a, a static test and a dynamic test. And basically uh, you turn the ignition just to the on position. And uh, there's a little bit more to it, but in short, the check engine light will flash in certain sequences 
uh, and then the dynamic one is where you would actually run the engine and you would, uh, I know it sounds strange, we could like turn the steering wheel and hit the brake and do a couple other things and it will flash the same um, code. And uh, I'm not sure why you have to do both of them, but whatever the case is, I went ahead and just followed the instructions and sure enough, it played off. It flashed a code of, I believe off the top of my head, it was 332. And when you look that up, the description of the problem is insufficient EGR flow. So EGR is a, an exhaust gas recirculation system. It's an emissions control system. And it, um, it involves a valve. And as I understand it, uh, that valve is vacuum operated and it allows certain exhaust gases to recirculate uh, through the intake uh, to help burn off some additional fuel and it's an emissions control system. So um, there are, when I get on the internet and look at forums and YouTube videos, there's a variety of reasons why you may have insufficient EGR flow. Uh, but one of the most common problems tends to be around vacuum uh, because there's a lot of things, if you don't know, there's a lot of things in an engine that work off of the vacuum from the engine. So everything from, you know, brake boosters uh, to, in this case, that EGR valve. And if there is a break in a tube or, or the vacuum reservoir isn't working or a variety of other issues, it affects its functionality. So knowing that it seemed like the most common problem with those were vacuum related, I just went through and systematically started checking out all the vacuum lines. So Ford uses a lot of them in this vehicle. So here is an example. They have some, a lot of coupler points, some color coded vacuum lines. And a lot of times as they move through the vehicle, they'll, they'll wrap them in this corrugated stuff that uh, usually we associate with the protection of wires. So, um, I have to admit, I mean, at least I, there might be a variety of opinions, but I was largely, I know that these vacuum lines produce a lot of problems, but in a 30 year old vehicle, you know, I, it's kind of understandable to me, but uh, I was kind of impressed with how well Ford color coded these and and uh, maneuvered them around the engine compartment, but there is a lot of them. So long story short, I just systematically started following these vacuum lines and on the inside of the vehicle, I believe people call it the doghouse. And for some of you van uh, old school people, you can laugh at me. I'm just not super familiar with the terminology, but uh, this is on the inside of the car. This plastic piece right here actually comes off and you slide it out and you can access the back of the engine. As a side note, I actually think it's a really neat feature. Um, but uh, when I pulled that aside, there was some vacuum lines that, that were over basically on the back of the top of the engine. And I was examining those. I probably had spent 30 or 40 minutes just looking over systematically all these vacuum lines. And there was one single vacuum line that looked like it had melted. And uh, I uh, clipped it and uh, I got a, uh, uh, what I've seen as far as um, repairing those vacuum lines is I got a piece of rubber tube that was the inside diameter of that tube was exactly the outside diameter of the vacuum line. So when I clipped it, I just slipped the tube over it on either side. And, um, uh, and just for good measure, I wrapped a little duct tape around it since it had melted just to give the little connection a little bit more uh, protection. Jumped in the car or in the van, fired it up, checking when the light went right off. So um, I took it down. Got it smog, so I'm down here in Nevada. Got it smogged, past smog, flying colors. And I was uh, very optimistic too because the smog checks here for a vehicle this size, they actually put a, uh, a probe in the exhaust that uh, measures the emissions as opposed to just relying upon lack of fault codes or anything. Um, and uh, the guy said, the, it's I guess it's just a pass-fail test, but the, uh, uh, the van passed and uh, he said, you know, I mean, I'm taking the small guy's word for it, but he said a vehicle this old, if it passes, that's a pretty good sign. Um, and then I went down, and uh, because this was title out of state, went down and to our DMV, and they did an inspection, so that passed. Um, I had no specific reason to believe it wouldn't pass, but, you know, you just never know. And uh, then I went down, got a temporary moving permit, or actually, I got the temporary moving permit before I do that, and I got my appointment, so... So basically, from a mechanical standpoint, um, this thing is running tip top, um, and uh, um, and I'm in the process now of getting the title swapped over, and now I'll, I'll get it plated. 
to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of specific intentions of driving this around uh, while I'm working on it. But, it, you know, I did want to get the title swapped over and it is nice to have a you know set of plates on it and all that. The only other real mechanical issue which kind of bothered me a little bit was there was a lot of um, play in the steering wheel. Um, and uh, again, I went on the internet and started looking around and found out that this has a steering gear, so it's not rack and pinion. Uh, it's down there. I think you guys can see it right where my finger's pointing. I believe that's what it is. I'm looking at the screen here. And it has an adjustment. And it was a simple loosen the bolt, tightened up something. And this thing is uh, tip top again. No slop in the steering wheel. Tracks true, runs nice and smooth. And uh, mechanically, um, uh, this thing is pretty good. I, I don't really, I'm trying to think of any specific issues that need to be addressed. Uh, and I'm not talking maintenance, but, but in strictly in terms of how it runs and drives. This thing is pretty much there. So um, it was nice, about 40 bucks, and I fixed all the little problems I needed to. I can't beat that. And uh, so uh, as far as other maintenance items, you know, I definitely, uh, the coolant and the trans or the engine oil and the coolant had been flushed recently, so that's handled. Um, I do want to change uh, all of the gear oil and the differentials, transfer case, and... Um, uh, transmission. I want to change the uh, transmission fluid. Um, but I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, from a timeline perspective, uh, I haven't forgot about 7.0 here. This is uh, still the primary project. Obviously, I've been a little bit delayed here working on the van. But uh, I am going to uh, basically at this point just uh, leave the van as is. I got, I'm, got the process in place to get the title transferred, everything registered, I know it runs good. And that was kind of just really my initial goals with that. Um, I did go through and throw out some trash and you know pulled off some stuff that was broken around the body and things like that. And uh, so the next step is I'll roll in and I'll finish up uh, 7.0. Uh, I'm not rushing anything, but I expect to probably wrap this up in uh, maybe within about two months, maybe six weeks if everything goes a little faster than I'm expecting. And uh, I will be getting some, uh, I keep saying paint, and I've had a few comments where people asked about that. It's actually a, it's a polyurethane-based coating. Um, that's a more appropriate way to describe it. Uh, it's, it's essentially, uh, it's a bed liner product. It's a smooth bed liner product. All right, guys, I had the uh, video cut out on me. Uh, just a couple last things I wanted to mention was I did get a better extension cord. I plugged up the AC power on there and started testing some of the systems in it. Uh, the rooftop vent, or I'm sorry, correction, the rooftop air conditioner works really, really well. I was very surprised the thing fired up. Um, it was about uh, 100 degrees to the high night or high 90s to about 100 degrees out here when I had it fired up. Let it run about 20, 30 minutes, and it was kicking out cool air at about 53 to 55 degrees, which I think is pretty darn good. Uh, cooled the van right down. Uh, makes a little bit of noise, but it seemed all pretty normal noise for what I would expect an air conditioner to make. Uh, tried to fire up the Dometic three-way fridge, but I could not get that to work. Um, I know there's uh, been some mixed thoughts on keeping it or not. Um, I'm inclined to get rid of it um, and uh, uh, go with just a DC compressor fridge. Uh, matter of fact, a company, just in perfect timing, what's this company called? Set Power sent me this, uh, I believe it's a 45 or 47 quart DC compressor fridge. I thought it was really nice and rugged looking. I'll be doing a review of that here in the near future, but uh, since I have this and uh, I have a lot of experience with these DC compressor fridges, I find them to be pretty reliable and uh, efficient. And uh, I think I'm actually just going to pull the Dometic fridge uh, out of the camper eventually and uh, just put in that uh, DC compressor fridge. I'll have, uh, this is going to be way in the future, but I'll have solar and all that kind of stuff on top of there. So I'm not really worried about that. I do have to admit, I do like the idea of having redundancy in a way to run the fridge, but uh, you know, all of my truck campers, I, I use a DC compressor fridges and I'm, I'm largely happy. So I think that's the path I'm going to go, particularly since that uh, company sent me one to review. So that makes a nice, easy decision-making process on that. 
I haven't got a chance to check out the generator or the furnace. I will in the future, but I did watch quite a few videos uh, to kind of familiarize myself with how those systems work. Um, but I think I'm going to keep that rooftop AC. It works. It's aesthetically already there, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, as far as the timeline sense, my main goal was, uh, if I'm repeating myself, I apologize, I had the video cut out, so I'm trying to remember what I talked about, but uh, 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 van is mechanically running pretty sound. Like I said, I have some maintenance I want to do. Got the process in place to get the title transferred and registered. So largely the van is just going to kind of sit right now um, while I finish up Camper 7.0. Let's make a little wide angle there. Um, I might do some slow demo in the van and uh, kind of just gradually get rid of some of that trash just to make it easier. But uh, otherwise, my main focus will shift over here to uh, Camper 7.0. And I believe I already said this, but like I said, I hope to get this done in about six to eight weeks from now. Uh, the next steps on this is I have just a little bit more finished sanding, which has been the bane of my existence. That's so boring. Uh, and then I uh, hope to get a, a coating here on the next couple of days. So I want to thank all of you guys for watching. I want to thank all of you guys for all of your great insights and thoughtful comments, particularly as it pertained to the van. Stick along, and we will uh, finish up 7.0 and build out the van. And I think both are some really cool and interesting projects. And, um, you know, share these videos, guys. I mean, I... Uh, I might change up format here and there about how I how I do the channel, but I am, you know, I I do ultimately like doing these things. There's sometimes for a variety of reasons, different ways I have to do stuff, but uh, um, we'll keep growing the channel. Appreciate you guys watching. Talk to you guys later.